Hoy, como conferencia central, eh, tenemos al profesor Cameron Tompkins y para inaugurar esta sesión eh, lo hará nuestra rectora de la universidad, la doctora Cecilia María Vélez White. Eh, entonces, pues, bienvenida, rectora. Bueno, muy buenas tardes a todos. Eh, pues estamos en esta Bienal que empezamos hace dos días y que culminará este viernes. Es un espacio en donde nos estu nuestros estudiantes, profesores, egresados, invitados, tienen la oportunidad de reflexionar e intercambiar ideas sobre las tendencias que se están imponiendo en el mundo y especialmente en Latinoamérica. Estamos muy contentos con la presencia de expertos tan importantes como Cameron Tom, Tonkin Wise, director de estudios de la Escuela de Diseño de la Universidad Carnegie Mellon, Walter Miñolo, semiólogo argentino y profesor de literatura de la Universidad de Duke, Ana María Fernández, antropóloga de la Universidad Nacional y Kevin Murray, escritor y curador independiente. Muchas gracias a todos ustedes por aceptar esta invitación. El diseño industrial ha sido muy importante en la universidad. El programa está cumpliendo 45 años y ha graduado alrededor de 4.000 eh, profesionales del diseño y se ha posicionado como uno de los mejores programas del país. Este año, estamos seguros, va a recibir la acreditación de alta calidad eh, por parte del CNA. Esta segunda Bienal Internacional de Diseño busca consolidar un espacio que permite la convocatoria del conocimiento del diseño y sus diversas formas de diálogo y se apoya en prácticas y evidencias con el fin de demostrar que la creatividad como forma de pensamiento se materializa y se percibe en el ejercicio de la producción. Se intercala con otro evento muy importante que tiene la Facultad de Artes, que es Creación, que sucede en los años impares y que de manera amplia ahonda los procesos de creación de los programas académicos de artes, arquitectura y diseño. El modelo de interacción de cada una de las actividades de la Bienal caracteriza lo que hoy le interesa al diseño industrial tadeísta, esto es, procesos de enseñanza-aprendizaje particulares a la formación disciplinar, diversidad de perspectivas profesionales a través de la invitación e integración de diversos actores implicados en el ejercicio del proyecto, recursos técnicos y tecnológicos que faciliten modelar el ingenio y convertirse en una ventana cada vez más amplia que permita observar el exterior y la trayectoria global del diseño industrial y la visión latinoamericana de la profesión con las responsabilidades asumidas en el contexto nacional del diseño como motor de desarrollo del país. Esta, la segunda bienal, tiene como temática el diseño del sur y puede comprenderse como un concepto que busca que la academia valide los conceptos de la cosmogonía tribal, los conocimientos ancestrales y la artesanía para que sean estudiados y apropiados por la academia. La conferencia de hoy dará muchos elementos eh, en estos aspectos. Adicionalmente, busca integrar conceptos como el del buen vivir, la productividad, el consumo y la responsabilidad medioambiental. Asimismo, intenta integrar en la formación de los diseñadores industriales una ética de la creación que reconozca el otro y el entorno en el presente y en el futuro. Temas de esta Bienal también son los proyectos en materia de conservación de patrimonio, tradición y cultura material, aspectos que son objeto de investigación y creación. Estos temas se caracter caracterizan los convenios establecidos por la universidad con entidades públicas y privadas en, con los que nuestros estudiantes complementan su formación y le dan el sentido de responsabilidad social al programa. Con esta Bienal, Queremos invitar a que vivamos el diseño más allá de las aulas, a ser escuchados y a escuchar, a construir y a participar de una experiencia que deje huella en nuestros invitados, en los estudiantes y en la comunidad del diseño. Muchas gracias.
Quiero agradecer igualmente la presencia de nuestro decano de facultad, el doctor Alberto Saldarría Garroa, a todos los profesores y estudiantes quienes dinámicamente se han vinculado a toda la programación de la Bienal y quiero también hacer mención al grupo de estudiantes quienes han acompañado a los conferencistas y quienes han ayudado a organizar eh, las diferentes digamos, eh, actividades y acompañamientos que se le han hecho a, a nuestros invitados internacionales. Para introducir la conferencia, eh, quiero comentarles que nuestro conferencista de hoy, el profesor Cameron Tompkinwise, es director de estudios de diseño de la Escuela de Diseño de la Universidad de Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon. Ha sido importante para su trabajo el campo de la filosofía vinculada al, al proceso educativo, eh, visualizado esto desde las teorías de Martin Heidegger, a la filosofía del hacer, los estudios sobre cultura material y la sociología de la tecnología, todos temas importantes para el programa de diseño industrial. Cameron es uno de los facilitadores de la nueva escuela de creación en diseño, la cual presenta una serie de cursos que preparan a los estudiantes y diseñadores para un mayor y más amplio campo de acción a través de los retos que plantea el siglo XXI en estudios inter y transdisciplinares, equiparando, los estudios, equiparando con los estudios tradicionales del diseño con las nuevas miradas de la profesión. Cameron también preside la comisión doctoral que reestructura la Escuela de Doctorado en Diseño en Carnegie Mellon. Sus investigaciones alrededor de la práctica de la profesión aportan al campo de la nueva epistemología del diseño caracterizada la, por la práctica reflexiva y los estudios basados en artefactos. Cameron promueve, proviene perdón, de la Escuela de Diseño de Parsons, denominada la Nueva Escuela eh, de, de Diseño de Nueva York, donde fue decano asociado dinamizando los campos de la sostenibilidad, sustentabilidad y medio ambiente y tuvo asiento en el Design Center y el Design uh, Thinking de la Escuela de Diseño Estratégico. Previamente fue director de los estudios de diseño en la Universidad Tecnológica de Sydney y director ejecutivo eh, de diseño para el cambio más conocido como la Fundación Ecodiseño. El área fundamental de sus proyectos de investigación está en diseño sostenible, diseño de sistemas que minimizan el impacto de los materiales y la producción, así como el diseño de servicios, visto como alternativa profesional, que pro, eh, promocionan la economía compartida y el consumo colaborativo. La conferencia va a ser eh, realizada en inglés porque nos hemos dado cuenta que ustedes son bastante receptivos a este asunto. Sin embargo, tenemos dos profesores que nos van a apoyar por si acaso ustedes quieren hacer la pregunta en español para que ellos se puedan eh, traducir una vez que se abra este espacio de preguntas. Sin más, le doy la bienvenida al profesor Cameron Tompkinwise. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank me for this beautiful space that you are asking me to fill. And an apology. I apologize for not being able to speak uh, Spanish to you today. I will also speak English in an Australian accent, so it will be doubly hard. I'm sorry. It is a very rude thing that I do, but I am honored to be able to do it, so thank you. Uh, when I was conversing with uh, Alfredo, we decided that we might talk on transition design and the South. It is worth explaining that transition design is the name of the new focus for the whole of the curriculum at the School of Design at Carnegie Mellon. So I am uh, very excited to be able to talk to you about this idea. But it is only an idea. We do not know what transition design yet entails. We are looking for people to help us. So we have named an idea, a project, and the whole school has committed itself to this project. And now I am asking that you help us work out what this is. And I think there is a very special relation between transition design and south, southness. And in fact, this is not only mine, I have discovered. 
I am very excited to discover that this conversation is already taking place. So I think it's very important to say that I am not coming from the north, even though I was born in a part of the south. I'm not coming from the north to tell the south what to do. I'm instead trying to think about the way in which the north itself can be transition designed. And to do that, we need help, the very special help that I will argue the South can offer. You are in a unique position to help the North change its direction in the ways that it must. And that is what I would like to talk to you about today. Along the way, you will see that I am speaking very much from my background. As you heard in, in the generous introduction, I have a philosophic background, but I left philosophy to come to design. I was looking for agency. I was looking for the capacity to change. And again, I believe that design, human scale, material culture, and I'll repeat that because that is my definition of design, human scale, material culture, is a crucial change agent. In the West and the North, change has ignored material culture's role. Design is the thing that makes the difference, but you need to be able to understand design. And I think you are in a, a unique position to help me with that. My project is quite literally to dismantle the North. I'm not sure if uh, you're understanding me because this should be shocking. <laughs> is this shocking? <laughs> so it is my project, and it is not my project, it is the project of the people I have worked with for 20 years, Tony Fry. Uh, it's the project of uh, the head of school at Carnegie Mellon, Terry Irwin. Our project is to redirect the North. And to do that, this car, running down a highway must have people repairing the engine as it drives. And we must do this work and try to steer it, changing and steering at the same time. So this is my project. It is the project of many people. Here is an event occurring right now. Uh, occurring in Leipzig this very moment. You could live stream it. If you don't want to listen to me, you could look at this on your phone. And so here are people who are also dismantling the North. This is marginal, this is small, but it is strong. It does not fit conventional categories of communism or socialism, it is not a type of terrorism. These are people trying to actually grab society and move it. And that is the project that I'm involved in. I'm involved in that project because I believe that the North is a process of defuturing. That what the North does is take futures away. And this is Tony Fry's term. Tony Fry once gave a very famous uh, series of lectures on the history of 20, 20th century design, in which he recounted the way in which each moment in the history of European design was a kind of defuturing. And so for Tony Fry, the project of a design school is to train the people who can re-future, who can stop the de-futuring and turn instead to re-futuring, to creating new and different futures, to creating many futures, not just the one 
not just the one global capital driven future that we are told is inevitable. This is a project against inevitability. And again, I am not alone in this. There are many people who would suggest that the project of the North is literally bankrupt. The project of the North has not delivered any significant innovations for about 50 years. The way you live, the way I live now, eating, washing, laundering, cooking, commuting, even telecommunications, even computation, all existed in 1950. This appears to be new, but there were walkie-talkies, there were people speaking wirelessly in 1950. If there has been innovation, it is all leisure or an added layer of consumption. We are not yet seeing wholly new lifestyles. There has been no significant innovation in the North for 50 years. And the people of the North are beginning to sense this. They are beginning to feel that their jobs are not satisfying. They are beginning to feel that they are not winning the rewards of productivity. There is a strong feeling that the North has run out of ideas. Uh, Dave Graeber, the figure on the right, uh, once said the only real innovations we've had recently in the, last 50, in the last 20 years in relation to pharmaceuticals and medical have been Prozac, Viagra, Ritalin. These are lifestyle drugs. We have not had significant innovation. And so this is what we need to struggle against. One more terrible example. So this is the environmental Kuznets curve. It says that when a nation develops, in order to increase wealth, it must do a lot of environmental damage. It must log forests, it must dig up ground, it must do mining, it must do pollution. Then, and only then, when it is wealthy enough, can it invest in improving the environment. But this is an economic theory. We are not seeing this in the North. What we are in fact seeing is something that looks more like this. We have a distraction or an outsourcing of the environmental pollution. We are not seeing a reduction. There is not a global reduction in carbon emissions in relation to climate change. The environmental Kuznets curve is not proving real because the innovations are not on this side. <clears throat> So this is what needs to be dismantled. So how to dismantle it? What is the project of dismantling and redirecting the North? This is where I come back to where I began, design. The North is how it is by design. Not by singular design, I will explain in a minute, but by many designs. It is designs that have made us who and how we are. And yet, look at universities in the North, and they do not and have not understood design. Design is still a small discipline. It plays a very marginal role in the university. This thing that gave us the 20th century is still so little understood. 
So the very thing that got the North to where the North is, is not understood by the North. And if you cannot understand that, if I cannot talk to a high schooler about what insights go into something like this, if there are only very small number of graduates learning these skills, then that society is not in a position to redesign itself. It is not in a position to direct in new directions. And so we must begin to understand design. So let me make this argument instead of just claiming. Let me make this. Sorry. So I'd like to argue that design is everywhere and yet, on the other hand, design is nowhere. And this is, again, an argument of Tony Fry, uh, in particular coming from this book, Becoming Human by Design. So let me just uh, show you one thing which I'm very fond of. Does anyone know what this is? Yes? So this is us communicating to aliens. We sent this into deep space. It actually tells them exactly where we live. And it says to them, we live here, come visit. But if aliens came to visit us, would they find people who look like that? Now, if they landed in China, no. If they landed in Africa, no. But even if they landed in Bogota today, they, by the way, always land in North America, so don't worry, they're not coming here. Aliens only ever go there. But even if they were here or in North America, you don't see naked people. You are naked for about five minutes in the shower. If you sleep naked, you are clothed by your bed. We are clothed, as Martin Heidegger would say, we are bethinged. I am full of things and devices. I am able to move by design. I am completely touched by design. Every moment of every day, it is a designer who is touching you through things. You are all learning to be the people who touch people the most. All the other disciplines only get to touch humans through design. Design is the interface mediating every other discipline. Whether it is an engineer's uh, infrastructure, it manifests as plugs, as devices that somebody has designed. Whether it is the economy, it manifests as a shop, it manifests as money, as a credit card. All these human scale material culture, everything goes through that. That is design. It is the thing that is touching us and supporting us the whole time. Designers are the animists 
They are the anthropomorphists of us. You are supported by other humans through artefacts. Now this seems funny, this seems tolerable. What is strange is that so few other disciplines recognise this crucial mediating that design is doing. Uh, another quick example, which is in Spanish, though there is no words, I will skip if I can. Oh. I can't skip. You can look up this uh, yourself. It's called uh, El Employ, uh, the employment. It's an uh, animation. You've seen it. Yes. So very familiar, uh, lots of different characters, again, playing these roles. Every device is in fact held by someone. So we are who we are. We are the people who can listen to a lecture like this because a chair is holding your weight, because the clothes are keeping you not embarrassed, because the air conditioning is keeping you at 23 degrees centigrade, because the lighting, because of the flooring. You can listen to me. We can be humans doing this most civilized exchange, this humanist engagement, only because of design. It is design holding it. But it is many designs. It is not the capacity to be a modernist designer. Part of the problem, of course, is that there are too many of these things. For every little need, there is a thing. And so we proliferate the amount of stuff we have in order for us to be. We had to learn to become like this, and I want to talk a bit about why there is so much. This is not the result of shopping. This is not the result of consumerism. This is the result of the way in which design designs. This is what we do not sufficiently understand. So, a story, a North American story, the Depression, the New Deal, large public works creating dams, allowing for electrification. That electrification puts wall plugs in all our houses and then we can start to plug devices into all those things. And over the 20th century, we learn to liberate ourselves from people and replace them with things, with human scale things. Here is Levitt Town, the first great suburb. And here you will see in the top left a washing machine given in every house with the purchase to stop people using laundromats, to stop people using collective consumption. Here is the very picture showing that the 20th century freed you from other people and allowed you to be autonomous in your house because of things. Things are surrogates for people. They replace people. But things breed things. Things are species that proliferate. So let me give you another quick example. Here is a toaster, a simple device. This simple device cannot function on its own. This simple device obviously needs many other things around it to function. You need a knife and a cutting board. You need bread. Perhaps you need a bread supplier or a bread maker. You need cutlery and somewhere to wash your cutlery. You need jam or hot chocolate to subito. <laughs> yes. 
So all of a sudden, one thing becomes five things, becomes ten things. This is the ecosystem of things. These are things multiplying themselves. This is why I would suggest the North cannot control design. The things it designs design themselves. They go on designing. This is what we need to learn. These designs are designing not just other things, but also practices. They are putting us in particular habits and routines. So this set of things, this set of things only makes sense if you know how to get bread, if you know how to cut bread. My daughters cannot cut bread. When they have finished cutting the bread, the bread is squashed flat, right? It's very hard to cut bread and keep it still fluffy, light. It's a skill. So you learn to make a thing habitual to you. You have these skills. You know how to use a toaster. You all know do not stick a knife in the toaster, right? It's a good way to die. Right? So all these skills are now surrounding these things and holding them in place. The designer's job is to help people develop those skills. And the designer does that by again interfacing bodies with things. The designer uses affordances. The designer uses scripts to literally tie things to people. And this creates what I would call, and what Bruno Latour, French philosopher of technology, would call a monster. This is a hyphenated monster. This is a man with gun. It is a whole new creature. And we don't know how to control that creature. That is a different type of human. What you understand about humans from reading books will not help you solve this problem. The West cannot understand this. This is Bruno Latour's argument. The North cannot understand this fusion because it has a mind-body split, because it thinks of things as inert. You actually require a whole new ontology. You actually need to have animistic philosophies to understand design. The North has built itself on design and yet cannot understand how it did that. This is the problem that we are facing. These things get stitched together as practices. They get chunked together as a whole. And again, you can see that you can only use a toaster if you know how to breakfast, and you breakfast in a fast way because you have a job and you have to do a commute, these things begin to lock each other in. They become holes that are very difficult to break. And here I'm using the work of Elizabeth Shove and a lot of the work being done in relation to social practice theory. So the problem that the North faces right now is that it is what it is by design. That design is everywhere, and yet the North does not and cannot sufficiently understand design. What it thinks of as design is everything that you learn at school. It thinks of design as the modernist project 
of strong intention. The project of creating a singular, universal, new human. The project of design was a modernist project. There was a moment, and North America is testament to this, North America's development over the 20th century, there was a moment when it was possible to function at this scale, as you can see. So here is the New York's World Fair, here is the world of tomorrow, the GM stand. Here are people going to see what the future will look like. What they went and saw was this, and what we got 50 years later was that. They succeeded in modernist design. They gave us a singular vision, and they delivered a singular vision, and we live in the unsustainable legacy of that success. The problem is with all these design decisions adding together, it is very difficult to see consequences. It is very difficult to see round a corner. Here are two images of a problem that's associated with this device. Just as the inventor of the car did not anticipate traffic, so the inventor of this did not anticipate people texting and driving at the same time. And they did not anticipate that teenagers would lose sleep texting all night. This is an example of the fact that we are by design, and yet we cannot design our future like the modernists did anymore. And this, of course, is another famous example of us suffering the consequences of lots of small-scale decisions. And this is part of the problem. These are all very small-scale problems. Sorry, it's a small video and low quality. Each one of these balloons represents 50 grams of greenhouse gas. You can't see it, but you produce greenhouse gas every time you use energy. The average home produces over 200,000 balloons every year. Save energy, and you'll also save money and reduce your impact on climate change. You have the power to make a difference. So I just show you that because the problem is the multitude. The problem is the many designs. The problem is the many designs and their socio-technical ecosystems and their practices and the fact that all of this locks in ways that are difficult to dismantle. So how then to do the project of dismantling the North? And why am I talking about this at a forum about the South? So as I said, Carnegie Mellon University School of Design has committed itself to this idea. We are interested in building a version of designing that can respond to this situation I've just described, this networked practice inertia this system which is holding itself in place. This term transition is drawn from many places. On the one hand, it draws from ecosystem science. In ecosystems, they are resilient, they can suffer damage, but return to the same. But then at a particular tipping point, a series of cascading links the very things that gave them resilience cause it suddenly to change. It transitions from one state to another. It's in homeostasis and then tips and becomes a completely different system. And so we wonder what are the things 
in the world today that are the levers or tools that could enable flow change through systems. So this would be one principle. Another is the recognition of transitioning economies, in particular relevant uh, to the South, to the global South. The fact that these are all economies in states of transition. According to previous ideologies, the South is transitioning to be the same as the North. But if the North is transitioning, the possibility is for the South to transition ahead or differently and not follow that same broken model. Finally, we draw on the inspiration particularly of deliberate change. One of, I think, the most interesting models in the uh, global north at the moment is the transition town movement. So these are small communities in very wealthy nations, the United Kingdom where they began, northern France, northeast America. These are communities who have decided of themselves to decarbonize. They've decided to get themselves out of fossil fuels so that they can manage the process away rather than have peak fossil fuels suddenly disrupt them. They want to be ahead of the descent. And so they engage in community forums and entrepreneurship and they create new small local economies with sets of connected resilience remarkably successful movement, a really interesting example. None of this can happen without design because all of these ideas in the end have to manifest as human scale material culture. So it is designers who make the difference to transition handbooks. Now, as I said, Carnegie Mellon's School of Design has committed to this idea. We don't know exactly what transition design would be, but we feel that these are precedents and we are pulling these together. Other people, same idea, different context. So here is Arturo Escobar's work, particularly looking at transition looking at the role of both the Global North and the Global South in relation to that, connecting with post-growth, I showed you the degrowth at the beginning, and crucially, and really quite interestingly, all of a sudden Escobar is particularly interested in design and is trying to understand a very sophisticated version of design. And so again, right as we speak, Tony Fry is meeting with Arturo Escobar and his graduate students in uh, Chapel Hill in North Carolina and trying to think of these things. Another precedent for what we're trying to draw on is socio-technical transition management. Sorry, it's Dutch jargon. So these are people who come out of innovation studies strictly business-oriented innovation studies. How do we create new businesses that are more sustainable? How do we fracture the infrastructures at the top, do niche experiments at the bottom to constitute new practices like breakfasting or commuting or washing how do I actually change the way people live? You can't just do it in the middle. You have to fracture the top and you have to experiment at the bottom. This is called multi-level, multi-stage change. So here is in fact the philosophy behind the Carnegie Mellon School of Design's transition design framework. It is an attempt to constitute something around visioning, how to actually see what things will lead to, not to create a blueprint, but to create a forward trajectory. What, uh, what I saw in Kevin's book the other day referring to Dan Hill's work, a MacGuffin, something that will actually get the system moving. 
So how do you have a vision? How do you have a theory of change? Why do you think your design is going to change practices? Also recognizing that all of this comes down to, and I will come back to this, your own personal posture and mindset. It is very difficult to be a transition designer. You are forever living in a condition of hypocrisy. You believe one thing, yet you live another, and you are always struggling not to close the gap, but to keep the gap moving. Takes a lot of stamina, takes a lot of goodwill, takes a lot of people skills, things that design schools often do not teach. And then finally, we are actually constituting new ways of designing. And in particular, we are a school of interaction design. We teach communication design and product design, as you can kind of see in this diagram here. PCE, product communication environments. We teach that at the undergraduate level. We teach product design, communication design, environments design. At the graduate level, we teach interaction design, but with a focus on services and social innovation. And the PhD program, uh, which I'm currently in charge of, is about developing new knowledge around this new idea of transition design. You might notice that the whole framework exists within a condition of limits. 20th century design imagined that there were no limits and no consequences. There were infinite resources and the space of the artificial world could just keep expanding. This model teaches every design student you exist in a condition of finite resources and risk, what is sometimes shorthand for nature. <clears throat> okay, so let me talk, let me focus on one particular thing in relation to this. By way of conclusion, I would like to focus a little bit on posture and mindset. And I'm doing that because I want you to get a sense of the extent to which the North cannot get to transition design itself. It needs others, and I mean that philosophically, it needs others for it to see the water that this fish swims in. It needs others to change its fundamental mindsets. And so I'll give you a funny example with this strange slogan. When I say the North is finished, I don't mean it's over. It has incredible capacity to keep doing what it is doing. It will continue to find cheap labour, uh, new forms of resources. It will continue to outsource uh, and externalise environmental costs. It will continue to create inequality. So the North is not over. It's going to keep going. That's why this is a struggle. What I mean when I say the North is finished is that modern 20th century, very Western design focuses on finishing things, on things that are complete. Here is something which is complete. It is self-contained. It is over. It works, but it works by staying the same. The problem with this, and I like to call this uh, serial monogamy, I'm not quite sure what the Spanish is, serial monogamy is when you only have one partner at a time, right, so not polygamy, which you get in the middle of America, right, this is serial monogamy. Designers do one thing at one time, and then they finish and they go on to something else. And quite often they never go back, and they never look back, and they get bored and they say, I have done that. I'm not doing that again. A serial monogamist is somebody who does this. Each one 
is finished. And of course, this is immediately out of date. And by the way, Apple is very slow. If I showed you Samsung's, it would be terrifying. Okay, so even this one, but I'm using this one because it is the icon of design. And it is about getting things to a state of finishedness and completeness. Now, the funny thing about interaction design, if you're learning to be an interaction designer, you will know that this does not apply to you. Don't worry about sustainability or inequality. Design has already transitioned. If you are an interaction designer, you are already in a state of constant beta release. You do what's called a sprint in an agile development framework, product development framework. You do a sprint, you release, you get feedback, you do the next, you iterate, you keep going. You are constantly designing on a platform. There is no finishedness in the new designing. Interaction designers bear very little relation to any of the other design disciplines. And only in the last five years, suddenly they have bifurcated and are going in very different directions. So interaction designers already understand something about transition design. They have given up the modernist project of perfectibility. They are not interested in the perfect. They go back, and this is a, a famous figure at Carnegie Mellon University, Herbert Simon. They go back to his idea of satisficing. What is sufficient? What is MPV? Does anyone know what MPV stands for in English? Minimum Viable Product, MVP. I said it the wrong way around. Minimum Viable Product. Minimum Viable Product is a state of finitude, of incompletion. Now, this is very new for the West. This is not a normal Western mode of thinking. All the philosophers who ever thought about becoming were marginal. Whitehead, Spinoza, Nietzsche to some extent, he was mad, forget about him. Becoming is not something that a Western mindset can tolerate. And yet being in a state of transition is never being finished. It's a very different satisfier. What satisfies you as a designer? What, when do you feel happiest? When the project is over? When the project is finished? When you can put it on a plinth and take a photo? There, done. And yet design is now in a state of constant transition. And then, as we said before, because things are interlinked, because the toaster and the knife and the plate are interlinked. Designers need to have a sense of, in the very famous quote of Saarinen, they always need a capacity to design in relation to the next thing, the next bigger system. Designers can no longer design things. They have to take responsibility for how this plugs to this, how this plugs to this, for the habits and lifestyles, I need to take into account that this will be used while driving. The next largest system is a car for a phone or just a street. I need to begin to think about these bigger contexts, not just in this kind of way, right? But the fact that in what was really going on with this device, if there was innovation here, and I don't think there really was, what this was doing was constituting a new practice, a practice that looks a bit like that. 
What do you call this? Is this working? Is this networking? Is this watching TV? Is this Facebooking? And it wasn't just this device, it takes the setting. You might remember when Steve Jobs introduced the, chair, the, the iPad, he sat in a modernist design chair with it on his lap. He was telling you how to use it. He was constituting a new lifestyle. Now, here is an example of transition design, not one that I am happy with. It clearly goes in directions that I don't think we want to endorse, right? This is part of this machine heading in a particular direction that we need to redirect. And there are other opportunities. There are moments at which it looks like we are dematerializing. There are moments that looks as if we are getting convergent practices. And yet almost immediately things re-proliferate. Right? A total nightmare of over design. This is your classic modernist gesture. For each need, one thing. I can't imagine sculpting practices. I can't imagine actually transitioning lifestyles, so I'm just going to throw one more product into the mix. So we need to be able to see that these things can constitute very different ways of being human. This is a slow process. This was eight years of hard work. This was eight years of some products over here, some new experiences, some new education, some new introductions, and then finally I end up sitting in this uh, chair playing with an iPad. But I have to get everybody used to cloud, I have to get everybody used to gestural interaction. Apple have done social learning transition design. Not in the name of sustainability, and certainly in the name of enormous value, but they've done it in a way in which they are recognizing what I think is a different form of designing. It is a designing that recognizes that each thing opens another possibility. You're not designing something for its own sake. You're designing it for what it enables. Everything is a stepping stone for change, for redirection. And there are many other examples that I could cite. This is quite a remarkable change in city culture in the North. Literally two years ago in New York City, the New York Times was filled with people saying, this is bad, this is communist, this will never happen. But it uses a particularly interesting version of design, a fairly forced imposition by a very large bank. Right? It is bankrolled and it creates a very visible intervention into the city in terms of the streets, in terms of the bikes. But it also cultivates new sensibilities. People begin to see the city in a very different way. In a city that has a shared bike system, distance changes. Your ability to think about space and time in the city is transitioned by this platform. The system itself is not finished. It has many problems, it has many factors that need to be improved, but what it does is open up a very different way of seeing the city, of experiencing the city. So these are examples of what I'm suggesting transition design might be. But to see these things, to see the way design is not about things, but about the habits and practices 
that it constitutes when linked up to a whole bunch of different systems, to see that is very difficult from the north. The north is the fish that swims in the water that forgets that there are things at all. It thinks that the only disciplines are economics and law and medicine. It does not recognise that you are not naked. The discipline that recognises that you are not naked is design. But to see design is very difficult from the north. It is drifting into new practices. It is drifting into these sharing economies, which I'll speak about tomorrow. And each of these offers a kind of bifurcation point, an opportunity that designers can jump on. But to really see this design, to see this design that the North has missed, even though it has used it, to see this design in a way that the North cannot, you need to be in a state of transition yourself. You need to be dissatisfied with the North or you need to be living in conditions that are not yet North. Then the material culture of human scale mediators becomes visible. Then the job of designing practices and lifestyles becomes possible. And for this reason, it is only, I believe, with the South that something like Carnegie Mellon's transition design venture is actually going to be realisable. And so I please implore you to help us see this new practice, transition design. Thank you.